All right, so we are live. So good morning, everyone. My name is Jesse, and I am with Exploring by the Seat of Your Pants. For those joining us for the first time, we are all about bringing conservation, adventure, and science into classrooms around the world. And we are so excited because this is our first week of February. And February for us since the get-go has always meant that we kick all the men out and we spend the entire month highlighting incredible women in science from around the globe. So thank you guys so, so much for joining us today. And we're really looking forward to this presentation, one of our first ones of the entire month. So right now I've got two classes joining us, both in the US. Uh, we're expecting a couple others, so hopefully they come in soon. Uh, we've got Ms. Rosenberger's grade two through sixes in Cambridge and Massachusetts. Hi guys. Hey, welcome in. And we've got Ms. Weaver's grade sixes in Ocean City in New Jersey. Hi guys. Hey, <laughs> welcome in. Of course, the reason you guys are all here today for our speaker. So we had to change it last minute. Some things happened at the Space Agency. So today we have Miriam Michael joining us. She is going to talk a little bit about the amazing work she gets to do as an engineer at the Space Agency and a little bit about what we do in Canadian Space Agency in general. So without further ado, thank you so, so much for joining us, Miriam, and take it away. Perfect. Thank you so much for having me, Jesse. Um, so as Jesse said, my name is Mary McHale. I am an engineer at the Canadian Space Agency. Very specifically, I am a project management engineer. And today I'll be talking to you a little bit about what I do here and some of the cool projects that I've had the opportunity to work on. So we'll get started. Okay, great. Everyone can see the screen. Yeah, we, we actually had it full for a second and now it's back where there's the one slide with a little slide on the right. <laughs> Sorry. No, give us one second here. Take your time, no worry. Uh, we do have a class tuning in from Georgetown, Ontario too, a big class on YouTube oh, as well. So welcome okay, fantastic. We're happy to have everyone online. So thank you all for joining. Yeah. I could cue Jeopardy theme music. There we go. Perfect. <laughs> good. Everything's good. Okay. Yes. Perfect. So I will get started. I'll talk a little bit about myself. So I completed a bachelor in aerospace engineering from Ottawa at the Carleton University. And my interest, you know, when I was younger was really always science, um, math, and somewhat some tech, but I was really more so focused on chemistry and physics. So I decided to really explore that. And engineering is kind of the reason why that's the path that I chose to take. And aerospace, well, you know, you could study aircrafts and you could also study space. So why not? That sounded pretty cool to me. So that's the reason why I decided to go into aerospace engineering. So from that, um, completed my degree, did I got to do a few design courses, got to do a lot of labs and hands-on experience. And that's something that's really very important in, in engineering. You have the opportunity to actually do a lot of hands-on work along with the fact that you get to learn theory and actual practical application. And engineering is really used everywhere in our day-to-day -day life. So everything that you do, there's some sort of engineer that has really purposed it and made it very useful for you to use. And our purpose is really to help others and to help the general public into making their life a little bit easier. So that's why I decided to go to school in aerospace engineering. Um, from that, after graduation, I actually uh, worked at the university, at Carleton University, and I started a mentorship program. And this mentorship program was for high school students who were interested in engineering, but didn't know what type of engineering to go into. And what I always like to say is start off by figuring out what you don't like. There's so many different fields in engineering, but you know, perhaps maybe you don't want to be a coder, or maybe you don't like biomedical, or maybe you don't necessarily like, you know, computers. There's so many different types of engineering that's available, and you could really figure it out that way. So the purpose of this mentorship program was actually the opportunity for high school students to shadow a second or third year student in their choice of engineering at the school. So they actually got to go and sit in on all their lectures and classes and even some of the labs for a full day. So fluid, fluid mechanics, they got to sit in on that, um, learning about fluid dynamics, solid mechanics, everything in that way, they actually had the opportunity to sit in on those classes, which was something that may be a little bit surreal, but it was super cool for them. And I think that was a really awesome experience. Also upon graduation, um, along with the mentorship program, I was a outreach officer. So I actually went into local schools, um, high schools and some elementary schools to really talk about what engineering was and what engineering was very specifically at our university. And that was a really amazing opportunity. Um, I actually traveled Ontario wide in Canada uh, to speak about Carleton as a whole, and then engineering very specifically. So that was 
something that was fun to me. So I really always enjoy doing outreach presentations, which is why I'm glad that I have the opportunity to do this uh, presentation here for you today. Yeah. So Miriam, sorry to interrupt really quick. No. I just want to note, I don't know if you guys are switching slides, but they're not actually switching if you're trying to do so. No, I haven't switched slides yet. Okay, perfect. Just making sure. <laughs> <laughs> cool. No, no problem at all. I'll be switching in just a second. Thank you, Jesse. Um, so yeah, so that's some of the opportunity that I've had the, the chance to do. And then from there, I pursued a project management, uh, you know, further education in project management. And then I had the opportunity to come to the Canadian Space Agency. And now I'm working as a project management engineer. And I've been here for two and a half years now, close to three years. Um, so it's been whirlwind of a ride. And today I'll be talking to you a little bit about some of the projects that I've had the opportunity to work on. So first and foremost, we have the RadarSat Constellation mission. Now the RadarSat Constellation mission is a triple satellite constellation, um, very specifically focusing on Earth observation. Uh, this was a Canadian mission that we launched actually out of SpaceX in California and Vandenberg very specifically um, in June of 2019. And so that was really cool. It's a really great satellite mission that we have here. And the RadarSat Constellation mission actually has the opportunity to revisit Canada up to four times each and every single day, which is amazing in terms of coverage. Um, some of you may know that Canada is quite large, second largest country. Uh, we have the longest coastline, actually, as a fun fact. Um, you can kind of see that here. We're surrounded by three different oceans, as you can see. So being able to actually revisit up to four times a day is amazing within that. And on top of that, you know, 90% of Canadians actually live within 200 kilometers of the border. So that's a little fun fact for you there. Um, we're not necessarily dispersed all over the place. We're kind of concentrated in some areas. And the purpose of Earth observation is really the opportunity to actually see all of Canada and to assist others. And by that, I mean, you know, the Radosat Constellation mission provides benefits to farmers up north, wildlife, um, marine surveillance, and so forth. There is so much that actually goes on. As an example, farmers actually use satellite data to actually help for producing better quality crops. Um, and what that means is that they're actually able to accurately detect you know, water levels, moisture levels, um, types of soil in terms of just radar sat imaging. Uh, so there's a lot of crop health that's actually able to be better detected using radar sat images. And for that, that's something that we assist and give back. So the radar sat constellation mission, it was launched in June um, and it has now been in operations for a little over a month, about a month and a half or so now, uh, give or take a little bit. And so that's something that's really cool. So we're now actually starting to receive images and produce images and actually being able to provide that to our partners. And from there, you know, radar sat imaging is also used during major disasters is something that I'd like to note. So, you know, for floods, um, hurricanes and so forth, we actually use radar sat images to really look at before and after pictures. And what that means is that you're actually able to see what areas have been severely affected. And from there, you can use these images to actually you know, triage and figure out where you should go to first and what neighborhoods really need the most help. And that's something that satellite imagery really provides and does. And again, being able to revisit Canada up to four times a day, um, just for helping different people within the country, it's really super fantastic. But from there, let me talk about the International Space Station. So a lot of you get to see, you know, different astronauts that are launched into space, which is something that is super cool. Um, but the ISS does a lot. So the ISS is what's, you know, the abbreviation for the International Space Station. And there's so much that goes on on the ISS. You know, there's everything from health, uh, biology, um, just really just many different types of research and studies that are done. It also always has a permanent crew of between three to six people. Um, you know, so there's astronauts in there right now. And it's usually from, you have NASA, you have ESA, you have us, you have Roscosmos, which is the Russian space agency, JAXA, the Japanese space agency. So there's multiple different types of people um, coming in to do different types of research, which is really something that's really fantastic about the International Space Station. And you can see on your screen here as to how long and how large the actual International Space Station is. And this kind of hovers around, you know, above 400 kilometers or so above Earth. And you can really see how these images are just so so amazing to see and they capture so much of what we have here. Um, but you're probably wondering, well, what are those little robots and stuff that are hanging out, uh, you know, the ISS? Well, uh, you know, we have Canada's contribution here is we have the CanArm along with Dexter and the mobile base servicing system. 
And so we have all these things that robotics has contributed from Canada and within that. Um, so I'll talk a little bit about the Canada arm. And here you have the Canada arm with an astronaut on the end, you know, being able to do an EVA, which is super cool. And so this is 17 meters long, which is really quite long. It actually has the ability to also handle loads weighing up to eight school buses. Could you imagine eight school buses just like, you know, hanging out at the end of this 17 meter long arm? Exactly. And it has multiple joints of freedom. Um, so it can it can really move all around. And we actually use the mobile based servicing system to, you know, move it along kind of like in a caterpillar type of format along the ISS, which is something that is super cool in terms of servicing different parts of the ISS. And it helps, you know, perform station maintenance, um, also along with catching cosmic catches. So when we have uh, resupply missions that go up, the Canada arm actually is one of the ones that catches it um, before it is potted into the ISS is kind of the best way that I can describe it. Um, Canada right now, so here at the CSA right now, we are actually working on Canada arm three. Um, and that is for the Lunar Gateway mission, which is something that is super exciting. Uh, so CSA is partnered with NASA. As you all know, we're looking to go back to the moon. Um, and Canada's contribution in terms of robotics is Canada Arm 3. And that's something that we are in early stages of working on. So that's something that's super cool. But let's talk a little bit more about the handyman on the ISS. His name is Dexter. Um, a really fun fact also for Canadians, the Canada Arm 2 and Dexter are actually on the back of a $5 bill. So, you know, you can see Canada's contributions there, which is super fun. Um, for Dexter, actually, I was part of the project that we're, is working on um, the deployment vision system. And what that is, is kind of like it's a camera that attaches to one of the hands of Dexter that actually gives you imaging all across the ISS so that you're actually better able to see what is going on and if there is maintenance and stuff that needs to be done. So that's something that's really cool. Uh, it's a new eyes and equipment, you know, 3D modeling and so forth, which will assist us in terms of maintenance for the ISS. As you may know, the International Space Station really is, you know, it is kind of old. So that's, that's something to consider. <laughs> um, there's a lot of maintenance that takes place and we no longer need to put astronauts in danger to do some of these things. And we have people like, you know, we have robotics like Dexter along with Candarm that actually are able to complete a lot of this maintenance. All right, so astronauts, um, you know, when you think of the Canadian Space Agency or you think of NASA, astronauts are not the only job that there is there. You know, I'm an engineer and I work at the Canadian Space Agency. Uh, we have our communications team. We have scientists. We have so many different types of people. And I'll kind of just show you guys here all the different types of possibilities for careers in space. Um, there's doctors. As an example, someone needs to care for, you know, the astronauts. You may have seen them when they land. Uh, you know, sometimes they're very out of it for the best way that I can put it. They've just, you know, catapulted into, you know, into Earth and there's a lot that's going on with them and they need to get readjusted. Uh, you know, you're starting to feel a lot of things that you weren't feeling necessarily on the ISS. So doctors are here to help. Um, there's mathematicians, uh, astrophysicists, flight controllers also. You know, somebody has to control Canada Arm along with Dexter when they're doing maintenance on the ISS. And those are flight controllers. There's also, you know, different types of scientists, geologists, biologists, um, and so forth. And that's really for, you know, all of our extra missions. We have rovers, you know, that go to Mars and they collect samples. And you have scientists that work on that to be able to actually analyze these things. So that's something that's really cool. So there's many different options. If you're interested in space, you don't necessarily need to be an astronaut or even an engineer. There's so many different options that are available to you. So, you know, you can look at STEM as a whole um, and even outside of that, just different ways that you can get involved if it's something that is your passion of getting into it. And like I said, you know, my career path into get, working at the Canadian Space Agency wasn't necessarily very direct. Um, like I said, I did some recruitment and some outreach uh, after my degree, and then I proceeded to, you know, get a job here at the Canadian Space Agency. So you don't necessarily always need to go on a linear path to get to your end goal. There's many different ways that you can get there. And also everything that you do is skills that you build in order to get to your dream job, as an example. So now I'm just gonna talk a little bit about um, the Junior Astronauts Campaign. So this is something that is being done in Canada for the Canadian at the Canadian Space Agency. So it's really geared towards students in grade six to grade nine. So if you're currently in school right now, you can actually get uh, your teacher to register and participate and be a part of the Junior Astronauts campaign. Now, let me go a little bit into 
what different types of activities and what it is. So the Junior Astronaut Campaign is actually, you know, a campaign that has activities in three different streams. So science and technology, fitness and nutrition, and teamwork and communications. And so what this is, is that teachers or, or schools or organizations have the opportunity to register and they will get access to all of these activities. And with that, if you complete one activity um, per stream, you actually get an opportunity to put your name into, your school's name into a ballot to win a visit from an astronaut, which is something that's pretty cool. And we're looking to have, you know, at least two visits per astronauts per province within Canada, per province and territory within Canada. And so we have many, many different types of activities that kind of fit all needs. And the reason why is that, you know, to be an astronaut, and this is why we call it the junior astronaut campaign, um, you have to have skills all across the board. You can't just be someone who is really good in science. Like you have to be able to work on a team. You have to be able to communicate with a team. Like I said, you know, crews on the ISS are between three to six people and you can't be isolated the entire time. You're gonna have to talk to them if something happens. They're the only people that are there. If you don't know how to communicate and you don't know how to work in a team, you're not gonna do well. Also, you have to be fit and you have to eat healthy, which is something that is very important just in regular day-to-day -day life, but also as an astronaut. Again, you're going all the way to space. You wanna make sure that you're in tip top shape. If anything happens, you know, it's not a 15 minute ride to the hospital. It's, it's a little bit longer than that. So there's a lot of different um, places you need to go to. So for US students and educators, um, unfortunately you can't participate in the junior astronauts campaign. However, um, once the campaign is over, we're actually gonna be making all of these activities available online for everyone. So for the entire public and you have the opportunity to then be able to use these activities within your classroom, they're low cost and you know low to no cost and very minimal material that's required. And it's a very easy way for you to integrate you know, STEM into your classroom um, for whatever reason that you may like. And that kind of sums up a little bit about basically what I do here at the Canadian Space Agency and along with what we have available. Fantastic. Well, thank you so, so much for that, Miriam. That was an amazing presentation. I want to stress to our classes, especially that they're going to release these, uh, these uh, activities after the fact. Um, so we've done a series of sessions with junior astronauts over the last few months. So you can check out Patchmaker, Dragon's Den, and Survivor Moon specifically on our YouTube channel. They're really amazing programs, and I encourage you to do that. It's a fantastic program. For our Canadian classrooms tuning in on YouTube too, sign up immediately. It's a lot of fun. So we're going to dive in with questions. We've got our two live classes. We've got some classes joining live on YouTube. So the YouTube classes, if you guys want to type in questions in the chat bar, please do. Don't be shy, and I'll pass them along to Miriam. But let's start by going to Ms. Rosenberger's class. If you guys want to kick us off with a question, come on up. Um, so what do you take pictures of with the cameras? On space, in, you mean? In space, yeah. yeah. Um, so many different things. So sometimes I'm sure that you've seen some astronauts have, you know, had the opportunity through the Copula to kind of look and take a picture of Earth, which is super cool. Um, and sometimes they can even see, you know, natural disasters occurring. Like you can see when a hurricane is coming on. Um, there's different ways they see those things. So that's super cool. But also with the camera on the hand of Dexter, we actually take imaging of the International Space Station so that we can produce, you know, 3D models here if there's issues so that we can fix them on in space. Fantastic. Great question, guys. Kick us off. All right, let's head to Ms. Weaver's class. Come on up. <laughs> what can the Raider Sat Constellation satellites do that other satellites can't do? Ooh. Oh, that's a very good question. So, Raider Sat imaging is very specific in looking at, so, like I said, uh, maritime surveillance, ecosystem surveillance. Um, and also natural disasters. So it's very specific to radar sat satellites and other radar sat satellites do exist, but they may not service, can't, they don't service Canada necessarily in the same way. And what that means is that for us, we are able to actually have a revisit of up to four times per day, whereas sometimes other satellites may take, you know, may only visit certain areas twice per day. So you actually can't get all the help that you may need immediately. Um, and that's something that's a benefit of the radar sat constellation mission. Thanks. Good question. Yeah. Um, I want to, again, stress Stewarttown Public School on YouTube. If you guys want to type in questions, please do. What I'm going to do now is take two questions at a time from each class, just so we don't have to cycle quite as much. So Ms. Rosenberger's group, come on up. I will take one and come right back for another when you're done. Hi. Um, so, 
How do you build different kinds of things? Right. How do I build different kinds of things? Yeah. <laughs> okay, so that's that's a really good question. So we do a lot of robotics here at the Canadian Space Agency, which is something that's pretty cool. You had the opportunity to see Ken Arm. Um, but robotics are also really different than satellites. That's not to say there's not some type of robotics on satellites. You know, there's system engineering, there's software on satellites, but robotics and satellites are, are very different. So we have different types of engineers that actually work on those different types of projects. And they're not just engineers, we have you know, technicians, we have scientists and so forth, but there's different people who with different specializations that actually um, build different things within us. So, you know, there's sometimes there's some people in different groups that I've never met before because, you know, I haven't had the opportunity to interact with them. And I primarily work on satellite missions while they, you know, may work on Ken Arm or Dexter as an example. Before we go back for another question, I just want to stress something. You highlighted again all these different roles that are at the space agency, and you did a slide on this and everything. Yes. But it even goes beyond scientific fields. I mean, lawyers, communication specialists, exactly. artists, like any job that you guys can do, anything that you're passionate about, if you're interested in space and you want to partner with them or be involved in the Canadian Space Agency and NASA and, and any space agency, you can do so, which is really exciting. I think. Yeah, that's that's exactly it. Thank you, Jesse. Yeah. So like I said, yeah, there's so many different ways to really get involved. And if space is your passion or space is something that's even like just interesting to you, you know, you don't necessarily need to go through one way to get there. You can there's multiple paths. Fantastic. All right. Uh let's go back to Ms. Rosenberger's class and then we're getting some questions in on YouTube, which is exciting. Ooh, okay. so come on up if you guys have another question. And if you're nervous, I can come back. <laughs> oh yeah, that's you. <laughs> no worries, Jesse. <Lizzie. laughs> Um, what do you do on the International Space Station? So when people are there, what do they do, Miriam? That's good. Um, they actually conduct a lot of research. A lot of our astronauts are up in space conducting research. And, you know, the research that they do in space has real world applications. Being able to actually conduct research in that very specific type of environment on the ISS is very important for us here on space, especially for health related matters. We do a lot of testing um, because the environment is just completely different. And we test astronauts, you know, before and after to see what the effects and what the changes are. Um, but that, that's kind of what they do. They spend a lot of time researching. Also some, you know, some astronauts tend to spend a lot of time looking outside, I should say, you know, being able to look at the view is something that's always quite nice. And when I say a lot of time, you know, during their spare time, um, but a lot of it goes to, you know, research, exercise also is really important. Um, because they need to work out, you know, their legs and their upper body to make sure that they're still in good strength. Um, yeah. Fantastic. Uh, we've fallen down the, the ISS rabbit hole. Your, your fault, you brought it up, it's so cool. So the questions on YouTube pouring in are largely related to that. And so the That's first cool. is, uh, how long do astronauts stay on the ISS? Um, so about six months is normally, I would say, give or take as to how long they're actually on there. Uh, Davy St. Jacques, that was just our Canadian astronaut that was on there, he was there just about uh, six months. So yeah, it's quite some time that they're actually on there. Yeah. And then what are some of the same class, uh, what are some of the risks for astronauts on the ISS? Well, I mean, what risk can you think of? <laughs> it probably exists. Um, but just, I guess, maintaining, being able to maintain being fit, uh, being healthy, uh, not getting injured in any way. But again, those are a lot of the precautions that we take beforehand, like I said, kind of looking into being very prepared. They do so much training as well. You know, a lot of astronauts will do about a minimum of two years basic training and so forth. And then they specialize in different ways uh, for different areas on the ISS. But there's a lot of training that goes in, a lot of underwater training that actually happens as well to get them prepared for, you know, life in space, basically. So there's a lot. I can even list all the risk factors because, I mean, I'm sure they go through it and it's very slightly nerve wracking, but you also have astronauts that return to space many times. So yeah. obviously it's very thrilling at the same time too. Absolutely. We actually had a, a medical doctor as one of your astronaut candidates back in 2017 named Adam Sirik. And he talked about the training that went into not even becoming an astronaut, but just training to possibly, be, you know, have that chance. Yeah. The things they put people through at the space agency are, are internationally renowned. So you guys have a reputation of making sure people are very prepared for all those risks on the space. It's what we try to do. I think preparation is one of the biggest things that you can also say for an astronaut, right? Like it's, it's really important. Like I said, you're, you're far away and you're, you're on your own. You're, you're really, on the International Space Station, there's no one, there's only you and the crew members that are there, that's it. So you have to be able to communicate, but also be very prepared. Yeah, fantastic. All right, I'm gonna go back to Ms. Weaver's class for a couple questions. So if you guys wanna come up and we'll go right back to you right after this. Yeah, you're good. 
What happens if there's a problem with a satellite? Ooh. Okay, that's a very good question. So depending as to what it is, um, we actually are able to do satellite, uh, like software patches. So sometimes some issues are related to software. And so we do software patches from here on earth and they're uploaded onto space. So the same way that you, you know, upload videos onto YouTube or you, you know, download things, it's the same type of information that we do on satellites as well. So we actually upload software patches to space, to the satellites um, when issues may arise. Excellent answer guys. All right, Ms. Weaver's class, come on back up if you have another. Uh, do your satellites collect data about other countries? And how do you communicate this information? Ooh, like spy satellites? <laughs> <laughs> I actually like that. So as a, as a little fact, um, CSA along with, uh, you know, 13 other space agencies are actually part of the International Charter of Major, Major Space Disasters, Major Space and Disasters. Um, sorry about that, a little bit of a mouthful. <laughs> And we actually help countries worldwide when they're in, when a natural disaster occurs. And what that means is that, you know, if it's a country within Europe, a country within Asia, a country within Africa, um, we are actually able, if they're an authorized user, we're actually able to provide them with radar sat imagery uh, if they need it in terms of natural disaster does occur. So we can see before and after pictures. So yes, in general, we do collect some data, but only when it's required. Like we don't go over other countries and are collecting data all the time only when we are, you know, authorized to collect the data. Yeah, great answer. All right, uh, I want to take two more questions from YouTube. Ms. Rosenberger's class, I know you guys have to go for lunch, so just uh, bye to you guys. Thanks so much for tuning Thank you. Um, so yeah, back to Stewarttown Public School. Uh, and I love this question. We can segue into a large one. So they asked, how much did Dexter cost? And I'd love if you could speak on cost of space things in general and why it's so important and why it's uh, worth it. So yeah, yeah, of course. Um, I'm not sure as to how much Dexter cost. Uh, to be honest with you, I know for, okay, so because I was part of the Radarsat Constellation mission, and those are three satellites, those three satellites cost about 1.9 billion. Um, that's, that is the cost of, you know, satellites, which is a lot of money, yes, but the, what we get out of it is actually so great. Like I said, being able to actually see, you know, even if you just think of using satellites for natural disasters, that's something that has huge effects to helping everyone you know, the entire population, but also being able to help farmers, which is a direct correlation to us here. You know, we need to eat, we have produce and, you know, fruits and vegetables that we need to get. And so being able for farmers to accurately see what their crop health is, is very important. Um, maritime surveillance, that's just, you know, general safety, but also climate change. Um, you're able to see that as well, you know, up north with uh, icebergs and so forth. And just, you know, a lot of remote communities need to know is the ice thick enough for us to actually go through it over, you know, with a car or so forth? Um, that information you're able to get actually with Radarsat. So that's something that's really cool and really important. So yes, I do know cost is high for a lot of things, um, but the benefits for us, I think, are are worth it in many ways. Absolutely, uh, I love Neil deGrasse Tyson's analogy. He says, and this is the case in the U.S. and I think it's even less in Canada. But if the entire budget of the states were like a hundred dollars, uh, then NASA gets four tenths of one penny. It's like yeah. it's, it's yeah. an astronomically small, astronomically small portion of the <laughs> budget that accomplishes so much and inspires so many people. And so, uh, you know, beyond worth. But I love that. Exactly. Question. No, that's that's a really great way to to you know as an analogy and to look at it. And that's true for Canada. It is even less than that um, for us. Exactly. Um, so yes, for all for that little little amount that we do. Exactly. Yep. Um, all right, I'm gonna go right back to Ms. Weaver's class, but I have to ask this, this is the ultimate Canadian class question from the YouTube class. Have you met Chris Hatfield? <laughs> <laughs> that is a great question, that is a great question. No, I've actually not had the opportunity to meet Chris Hatfield. He's been in the same building um, as me, of course, but uh, I have not had the opportunity to meet him. Uh, you know, unfortunately, Chris Hatfield was an, an active astronaut before I started here. Um, I've met our current, I've met all of our current astronauts though. That's good. Um, okay. That's a start, but you know what? Yeah. Now Chris, this is going straight to YouTube. So Chris is going to have to come by <laughs> and make that happen. And we want That's very to true. Yeah. Okay. Um, Ms. Weaver's class, I know you guys have this like cue just off screen and I love it. So come on up and uh, ask away. What kinds of things do you do at your job on a day-to-day -day basis? Great question. That is very good question. Um, so I'm project management engineer. So there's a lot of meetings that I go to. Um, a lot of these meetings are with contractors in terms of making sure that the project stays on task, on schedule, on budget, which is actually very important. All those things are very important. Um, so what that is, a lot of inter interfacing with 
a lot of other people, whether it be people within the building or people external to the building. Um, that's kind of what I do. And also just making sure that things are moving along as they're supposed to. So, you know, we have an end goal that we're trying to get to, and we need to make sure that we're all moving towards there effectively. And sometimes it's, you know, making sure people go down the right path and not get off track. So it's steering things and making sure that they stay on track. That's kind of my day-to-day -day life, I guess, best way to summarize it here. Fantastic. All right, I'm going to take one more question from YouTube and then wrap up. Oh, I'll take one from Miss Weaver's class. No, no, sorry, Miss Weaver's student. They was right there, and I, I can't say no. <laughs> you can't on. say no. It's okay. Who controls the Canada Arm Two, and how is it controlled? Ooh, oh, that's a very good question. Um, so we have flight controllers here. So we have a mission control room also here at the Canadian Space Agency. And it's some of our flight controllers actually down here that control the Canada arm when there's operations that are taking place. Um, and it's done. So they, you know, they write up what the operation will be. There's testing, there's simulations. And then from there, they actually control it right here, uh, you know, in St. Hubert, Quebec. And that's where it's done. It's with flight controllers here. Best video game ever. <laughs> yep. Yeah. All right. Uh, the question from the YouTube class before you wrap up is, there are astronauts from different countries in the ISS. Do they have to all know English to communicate and how do they communicate? So that's a very good question. Um, a lot of astronauts do know English, but as an example, you know, our astronauts do also learn Russian, like David learned Russian, um, you know, before going up to the ISS. And that's just to make sure that, you know, you have multiple languages that you can communicate in. And English is generally the most common language between all of the, all of the space agencies that go up to um, International Space Station. And it's more so just because we have so many different countries in space, you know, we want to make sure that we can communicate effectively that way too. Uh, by the way, for any classroom from any yes. country in the world, I want to say, uh, David St. Jacques, if you guys want to look up like the most accomplished human being of all time, <laughs> look up David's story. Like before, before he was an astronaut, it's just utterly ridiculous. He's a pilot engineer, uh, doctor, uh, you know, save the world, cured cancer, yeah. like when all, all at once in like a few years or something like that. Anyway. Yeah. No, David, da you're right, Jesse. David definitely has a, a, yeah, an amazing person overall. There's, there's so much that he's done and so forth. And it's, yeah, yeah no, it's, it's fantastic. If climate change is going to be solved, it's going to be David. <laughs> um, all right. I, I wanted to ask one more question because I'm surprised we haven't got it. So yeah, of course. I always like to highlight this in space presentations that for the kids in these classes, this is the best time probably ever in human history to be interested in being an astronaut or going to space or learning yeah. about space. We are pushing so many frontiers robotically. We're going back to Mars with the pros. We're yeah, it's fantastic. Space. Yeah. And so Mars, of course, is on everyone's mind. But one of the most recent announcements, which I want uh, you to speak on a little bit, is Gateway, Lunar Gateway. Can you explain a little bit of what we're doing? Because everyone's so keen on the ISS. So I know. No, it's true. So, you know, we're looking to go further, basically, is what it is. The ISS is 400 kilometers or so above Earth, like, you know, orbiting above Earth um, in terms of the orbit. Gateway, like the moon, is much further. And we're looking to go to go further to see. I mean, just the hurdles that we have to get through in terms of long-term space travel is something that we'll be looking at. Um, the health implications. And all of these things, you know, it's it'll be a large feat for us to do. Um, but all that to say is that just the benefits for us here on Earth are just fantastic. I mean, when you look at all the things like health and research that can be done um, through this long-term travel, long-term space travel, and so forth, it's just, it's going to be amazing. And the Lunar Gateway is really there to kind of just showcase, like, I mean, we want to get to Mars. We want to see what's out there. As humans, you know, we always have the desire to explore. And I think that's something that the Lunar Gateway kind of comes back to is just being able to explore. And if we have the ability to do so, why not try at least is kind of what we're going for. Awesome. Uh, for kids who want to learn more about you, about the Canadian Space Agency, about junior astronauts, where can we guide them when they're done this presentation? Um, so we can actually go onto the Canadian Space Agency's website. Yeah. Uh, I'm sure you can put it into the presentation somewhere potentially. Uh, we had it also on our slides, I believe. Um, Anyway, so you guys can go there. There's a bit of a bio on me that you can find. We also do have Instagram, Facebook, and Twitter. So if you follow us on there, you'll see all the cool things that we're doing. Yep. So we're all over social media, uh, especially on Instagram. If you like looking at pictures, we have a lot of cool pictures that are taken from the ISS, a lot of the cool pictures of the ISS, of our astronauts, of people here at the Canadian Space Agencies, and we have a whole bunch of videos as well. So when we're at events, sometimes we take videos too. So there's a lot that you can find out. There's a lot that's going on, uh, depending on your mode of information. It exists and we have it. Amazing. So I'm gonna pass along all those resources to our class that tuned in and the thank ones you. on YouTube as well. So thank you guys so, so much for that. 
Miriam, this is spectacular. I love this. Um, I know our class, had, our second class had to leave to go to lunch, but uh, what we're going to do at the end of every session is I'm going to demute the class's microphone. Um, so Miss Weaver's class, if you guys could get ready to join me and say a huge thank you to Miriam for joining us today. You are now demuted. Go right ahead. Thank you so much. Thank you. <laughs> Thanks, guys. Miss Weaver's class, we really appreciate you guys tuning in today. Uh, Miriam, again, that was spectacular. Thanks so much for being a part. Thank you for having me. It was a great opportunity, and I'm always happy to talk. Wonderful. Have a wonderful rest of your day, and we really look forward to more junior astronaut sessions and Canadian Space Agency sessions soon. Bye.